European thinkers hope for Malaysia's strategies to counter Islamophobia. National TVET policy to produce crucial skilled labour. Salam Malaysia Madani. I hope you're having a terrific Friday evening. You're now watching Malaysia Tonight with me, Daryl Baptist. European Islamic thinkers and scholars have proposed that Malaysia take the initiative to formulate effective strategies in combating Islamophobia. Prime Minister Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim said this was discussed during his meeting with them in Berlin, Germany on Thursday. Among those involved were thinkers and scholars from the International Institute of Islamic Thought, or IIIT, the Arab World Institute, and the Middle East and Mediterranean Research Centre, also known as CIRMAM. In a Facebook post today, the Prime Minister said he used his free time in Berlin to discuss and exchange views with his fellow thinkers and scholars in Europe. Discussions touched on several issues, including the role of scholars and new challenges arising from rampant Islamophobia in Europe today. The Prime Minister said that during the meeting, they also discussed the steps that needed to be taken to address these issues, especially in the West. Dato Sri Anwar is currently in Germany for a six-day official visit that began on 11th March. The Ministry of Natural Resources and Environmental Sustainability, or NRES, will continue to monitor the current hot spell affecting the country to ensure that prompt actions can be taken if necessary to safeguard the welfare of the people. Minister Nick Nazmi Nick Ahmad said several ministries and government agencies had been instructed to refer to the guidelines or hot weather monitoring manual developed by the ministry and to remain vigilant in facing any eventualities. He mentioned that the ministry has established the National Haze and Dry Weather Main Committee chaired by himself, and a meeting was held several weeks ago. Among those involved were representatives from the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Youth and Sports, Ministry of Education, as well as representatives of the state government and government agencies. Nick Nazmi said the committee held regular meetings to plan and coordinate the country's preparedness in facing hot and dry weather, El Nino phenomenon, implementation of open burning prevention measures and preparation for the possibility of haze. And now some news from East Malaysia. The Sabah government and a Fortune 500 company today signed an MOU to implement a 17 billion ringgit flood mitigation, irrigation and drainage projects in the state. The Sabah Irrigation and Drainage Department, or DID, on behalf of the Sabah Agricultural Fisheries and Food Industries Ministry and Shansi Construction Engineering Group Corporation Limited's Malaysian subsidiary, Shansi Construction Engineering Sindiran Burhad, or SCEM, inked the deal. Sabah Deputy Chief Minister Datuk Sri Dr. Jeffrey Kittingan, who witnessed the signing ceremony, said he was looking forward to the studies that were expected to commence in the fourth quarter this year, bringing about 20,000 job opportunities throughout Sabah. And the creation of uh, 20,000 uh, employment opportunities will be very good for Sabah. But most important is solving our problems. Flood problems, water, irrigation system, our uh, food security eventually will be the ultimate aim uh, for this investment. Now. According to the MOU, SCEM will conduct due diligence in terms of flood mitigation, irrigation and drainage works in 11 Sabah districts, including the state capital, Penampang, Tawau, Kota Balud and Tanom, among others. Signing on behalf of the Sabah government was State JPS Director Siraja Bashora, while SCEM was represented by its Chief Executive Officer, Cao Yu Lei. 
Malaysia has successfully seized properties valued at 990 million ringgit related to drug crimes since 2019. Recognizing the intricate connections between drug trafficking, corruption and other forms of organized crime, Malaysia remains steadfast in implementing effective strategies to combat those threats through, stri through stringent law enforcement measures. Home Minister Datuk Sri Saifuddin Nasution Ismail said the nation's law enforcement agencies have diligently dismantled a total of 98 clandestine laboratories and apprehended 351 individuals involved in such illicit activities. He said that in controlling the movement of drugs and psychotropic substances, a total of 16,865 import and export authorizations or permits were used from 2020 till last year. The findings of analytical laboratories regarding the detection of new substances serve as the cornerstone for regulating these substances under the national laws. He added that the proactive approach addresses the challenges posed by the emergence of new drugs and new psychoactive substances, ensuring robust control measures are in place to mitigate their proliferation and potential harm. In our business segment, Pulau Pinang records highest investment inflow last year. The National Technical and Vocational Education and Training, also known as TVET, policy set to be launched in June has a crucial goal of providing skilled labour for the country's workforce needs in emerging technology fields. Deputy Prime Minister Datuk Sri Dr Ahmad Zahid Hamidi described the policy as comprehensive and that it is not only coordinates 1,000, sorry, 1,345 TVET institutions but also involves the provision and enhancement of high technology based courses for this purpose. Datuk Sri Dr Ahmad Zahid said it is important to move beyond merely providing skilled labour in traditional fields such as sewing and hairdressing. He said while those courses can continue, the job market requires skilled workers in fields such as artificial intelligence, solar energy, electric vehicles, communications and hydrogen. Datuk Sri Dr Ahmad Zahid, who also chairs the National TVET Council Committee, hopes the policy will change the perception of some segments of society, particularly parents who view TVET as a secondary option despite the vast potential of the field. Currently, the employability rate of TVET graduates stands at 92.7%. Tech fans of giants Microsoft, you might want to pay attention to this piece of news because Minister of Investment, Trade and Industry, or MITI, Tunku Dato Sri Zafrul Tunku Abdul Aziz, will facilitate a meeting between Prime Minister Dato Sri Anwar Ibrahim and Satya Nadella, the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Microsoft. MITI, together with other relevant agencies, is working closely with Microsoft to devise a strategy to make Malaysia the digital hub of ASEAN. Tunku Datu Suri Zafrul, through a post on his X account today, said the Kakal Basama Malaysia initiative is witnessing a collaboration between Malaysia and Microsoft to make the country the digital hub of ASEAN. He added that Satya will visit the country soon to strengthen the cooperation. The minister further said he is looking forward to closer collaboration with Microsoft to drive Malaysia's leadership in the ASEAN digital sphere. Satya succeeded Steve Ballmer in 2014 as CEO and John W. Thompson in 2021 as the multinational technology company's chairman. Sticking in line with digital Asian hubs, Pulau Pinang recorded 71.9 billion ringgit in investment inflows in 2023, the highest in Malaysia driven by foreign direct investments or FDIs, which accounted for 61.7 billion ringgit or 85.8% of the state's manufacturing investment inflows. Chief Minister Chao Kon Yao said this was the result of the state's transparent, investor-friendly and competitive economic policies. 
He said the figure underscores international investors' confidence in the state's potential and the attractive opportunities offered across the board. In a release statement today, he said through collaboration with the federal government and the Northern Corridor Implementation Authority, or NCIA, the state successfully facilitated investments worth 13.67 billion ringgit, thereby creating over 14,000 job opportunities last year. Meanwhile, Chow, who is also the Finance, Economic Development, Land and Communications State Executive Councillor, said the Northern Corridor Economic Regions, or NCER, Technology Innovation Centre, NTIC, building in Banyan Lepas, is expected to be completed in the third quarter of this year. The centre focuses on activities related to research, design, technology, innovation and commercialisation. The port's segment started this year on a positive note as the export volume index rose 5% to 156.5 points in January from 148.5 points in the same month of last year. Am Investment Bank Burhard has maintained its overweight recommendation on the sector due to the resilient intra-Asian trade and potential hike in tariffs. In a note released today, the research house expressed confidence that there will be a hike in tariffs for all the ports under its coverage and West Ports has initiated requests for container tariff revisions. It also noted that West Ports proposed a 50% tariff hike a decade ago but was granted only a 30% tariff increase from the Ministry of Transport. And this was implemented in two stages, a 15% increase in 2015 and another 15% hike in 2019. M Investment Bank further said that in Sabah, port tariffs have been unchanged in the past 35 years and for Bintulu, it expects the tariff revision to take place after Bintulu Port Authority has been handed over to the Sarawak State Government. Meanwhile, in the telecommunications sector, M Investment Bank expects the sector's earnings trajectory for the financial year 2024 to be slightly negative due to lower profit and stiff mobile competition. However, the bank maintained a neutral call for the sector amid cautious mode due to uncertainties about the progress of the 5G dual wholesale networks business plan, a lack of growth drivers and high operational costs. According to M Investment Bank, there could also be regulatory risks as the government pushes for lower-priced mobile connectivity. It added the telecommunications sector's results for the fourth quarter of the financial year 2023 were within expectations. It said Axiata Group beat its forecasts due to strong performances from Excel Axiata and Robi Bangladesh. Albeit within expectations, Selcom DG Berhad and Maxis Berhad were affected by the declining prepaid segment and higher interest costs. Meanwhile, Telecom Malaysia Berhads, or TM, net profit grew by double-digit growth in the financial year 2023 on the back of tax credit savings and lower interest cost. M Investment Bank also reiterated its buy call for TM with a fair value of 7 ringgit 2 cent per share, which is expected to be a beneficiary of the National Dual Wholesale Network Arrangement. Welcome back, and now it's time for our On The Table segment. One that I'm quite excited for because the topic we're speaking about is one that's quite hot. This is On The Table with Otto. Otto, over to you. Good evening and welcome back On The Table, where we discuss current issues making the news. Now, following a swift recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, Malaysia will now focus on bringing the economy back on track. Now, apart from being an export-oriented nation, the country is also heavily relying on foreign direct investments, or FDIs, as a constant revenue stream. Now, with us via a video call, we have on the line Dr. Tricia Yeo, CEO of Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs Ideas. Dr. Tricia, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for you know, taking the time off your busy schedule to be with us today. Now, our first question is, firstly, we are heavily relying on FDIs. Is that true or not? And secondly, despite other forms of revenue streams, i.e. domestic direct investments, taxes, what else? 
So thank you again. Um, yes, I think as Malaysia is uh, an open trading economy, yes, um, despite the fact that we have a lot of exports and imports and we want uh, to, to ensure that trade uh, is a big part of our economy and uh, of course having also signed and ratified the CPTPP recently, uh, we would like to see that being promoted, uh, reducing you know barriers to trade. But the answer is yes, we still continue to rely heavily on FDIs, um, foreign direct investments. I think if we look at the statistics that were released for January to, to September of last year, in terms of total investment, FDI contributed about 55.9%, that's almost 56% um, of total investment, whereas uh, the domestic the domestic direct investments contributed about 44% of total investment. Uh, so FDI still is the majority share, uh, but we also have quite a strong domestic investment. In fact, this increased 45% um, year on year. So we would like to see both happening, right? Both foreign as well as domestic, because both uh, show up the, the confidence that they have in the economy. Um, the the thing is, because we still rely heavily on FDI, I think this is where it's very, very crucial. Uh, it continues to be important for Malaysia to promote a better policy stability and continuity, uh, demonstrate that there's good implementation of projects, demonstrate that we have strong institutions, and all of this collectively will paint a good picture um, of stability that foreign investors will see as attractive for Malaysia. We have a lot of good things going for the country. Um, we have great infrastructure. We have actually uh, a good talent pool, right, of people who actually can speak English and multilingual as well. I think we just need to correct some things um, in order for us to stay ahead of the game. Uh, I think the numbers also show that Malaysia is, you know, number four in the region. We uh, still at this stage, uh, quite difficult to compete with other countries on the rise, such as Indonesia and Vietnam. But if we demonstrate, as I say, all these things, then these factors collectively can show that Malaysia is still open for business and we can attract the kind of good quality investments that we would like to see coming into the country moving forward. Thank you very much, Doctor. Now, to add on that, the Prime Minister has been on back-to-back -back, uh, trips overseas recently. Firstly, we had uh, Australia, then Germany, that had churned out, well, rather good investments when it comes to various parties. Now, the numbers looks good. However, there is a process of uh, due diligence, etc., uh, most likely by MOF, METI, uh, before these investments can be realized, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, your thoughts on this? Yes, so um, just on the outset, I think we would like to say well done <laughs> to the delegation led by Prime Minister Dato Sri Anwar Ibrahim um, because these sorts of visits and trade visits are actually really important, um, these sort of investment trips, because it allows uh, Malaysia to showcase itself to these countries. Sometimes those businesses perhaps may not be aware of um, the high quality resources and the infrastructure and so on that we do have in the country. So it's great to see that, I think we've seen uh, from the news already investments from some um, major Australian and German companies um, coming into the country. So on your question about uh, whether or not there will be investment screenings, right, from MITI, uh, I do think that there is a National Investment Council and the National Committee on Investment. Uh, these committees provide some strategic oversight, um, advisory, coordination, and so on. Um, but you're right that the committee would like to see better quality investments. I think we've talked a long time about Malaysia moving up the value chain. What that means is that we want to see investments coming in that are uh, are going to contribute to greater economic complexity i think the research has also shown that when the it's not it doesn't matter so much which sector the investments are in but how complex the investments would be, meaning the, the, the kind of complexities that 
um, that in Malaysia, whether it's in manufacturing uh, and so on and so forth, these are, are good quality investments because it will translate into um, you know knowledge transfer among the labour sector here. Uh, and of course, we also don't want investments that will, for example, um, unnecessarily pollute the environment. So I think it's important to see uh, investments in the context of you know the broader ESG um, that we we are part of the global economy and we will inevitably have to adhere to some of these global standards um, as well. And I think the, the last thing to say on this matter is that uh, MIDA has just released something called TRAC. Uh, TRAC was formerly known as uh, PATRU. Um, it's basically to accelerate the, the project implementation process. Um, it's supposed to provide some kind of end-to-end -end facilitation service by projects approved by the National Committee of Investment. Uh, so these are all positive steps, um, but ultimately, like I said earlier, uh, all these things don't matter if we don't correct the the framework, uh, the strong institutions, you know, addressing things like corruption, um, independent institutions, uh, stronger institutions like separating the attorney general from the public prosecutor. Some of these legislative changes also do help to create a, great, a greater impression to our uh, international colleagues. Thank you very much, Doctor. Now that we see that we are in favor of uh, some foreign investments here in Malaysia, given like in Germany, now does the ringgit play another pivotal role in bringing in FDIs? Surely factors such as uh, stable government, good GDP growth play a strong factors. Your thoughts on that, Doctor? Yes, um, stable government is one thing that many people talk about. Uh, but I think the experience of Malaysia over the last few years, uh, interestingly, shows you that despite there not being a stable government, it is possible to have policy continuity and consistency. I think that is actually more important than having a stable government. Governments can come and go, they can change. But if we are going to still provide a secure, stable policy environment for businesses to operate in, then it actually doesn't matter which political coalition comes in. Investors, businesses, all they care about is, are we having the same policies? Can we rely on the institutions to uh, secure us these same policies? What we don't want to see are uh, you know, reversals of policies overnight if the governments change. And I think the last few years tells us that it's okay. Um, policy stability can actually continue. But um, as you say, things like a stable, I would say stable policy, um, good GDP growth, that's um, definitely important in bringing in FDIs. The ringgit is, um, I wouldn't say that the ringgit itself um, has a direct uh, role to play in bringing in FDIs. I would say that the, the status of the ringgit um, actually is more a sign or a symptom of, of confidence uh, generally in the country's you know, macroeconomic policies and microeconomic policies, um, how we've been able to um, you know, manage factors of production within the country itself. Um, but uh, yeah, as, as you know, you try to allude to, I think um, it's, it's, it is an indication. So it's not something to brush away lightly. Um, and you know, it's also a result of, of decades, right? Of certain economic structural issues that I think uh, are important to address. I've mentioned some of them, um, including making sure that our talent pool is readily available. Um, education is crucial uh, in making sure that we have that right talent pool. Um, looking at our institutions, I mentioned a little bit about you know addressing corruption, making sure we have stable policy. Um, all of these things collectively uh, will contribute to a greater, stronger ringgit, and that collectively would also play that pivotal role in eventually bringing in um, FDIs into the country. Well, seeing that you have laid out a lot of uh, factors over there, it seems that we're doing very well so far. But moving on to the next question, international chambers of commerce such as Malaysia China Chamber of Commerce, MCCC, American American uh, American Malaysian Chamber of Commerce, AmCham, among others, have been promoting bilateral trade investments. Your thoughts on their role in contributing to the economic growth? 
Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I think just to answer a little bit of the previous thing, the question that you laid out, I wouldn't say that we are, you know, doing extremely well. I think if you compare Malaysia to where we were in the past, uh, we were definitely the leader within Southeast Asia. And that's because we actually have fundamentally very good, um, you know, like I said, many factors going, infrastructure and so on. But if we don't um, actually catch up, we will lose out to our neighbours who are very much more aggressive than us. Um, you talked about chambers. So yes, of course, chambers of commerce do play an important role in establishing strong bilateral business to business and business to government networks. Um, and ultimately, this builds confidence in the country's investment environment. Uh, they also represent the investor community, right, both local and foreign. Uh, to actively advocate for regulatory and investment policies that promote competitive business and a thriving investment environment. So all of this should translate to more business opportunities and growth, um, but only if the government actually listens, right? So one thing that uh, I've actually heard of very recently is that the Chambers of Commerce um, regularly seem to have a problem with uh, processing things uh, under the you know immigration meaning that it's actually very difficult for uh, some of these foreign counterparts who are coming into the country right setting up their foreign offices here in Malaysia uh, to get their working permits processed in a speedily manner so that's something that is a very low hanging fruit um, hopefully this is something the immigration department under the home ministry would pay attention to because these things do matter in attracting business uh, business behind business are people uh, and behind people People are families. They will come here, they will eventually bring their families here. So if we ease that process, this would also indicate and show to the rest of the world that yes, uh, we want you here, we want your investments and we also will facilitate that in a way that would make it most efficient uh, and friendly for you to be here. Oh, definitely. Well, thank you so much for your time, Doctor, and I uh, appreciate all your thoughts and your ideas, especially how you laid everything out. It's very insightful. But uh, that's all the time that we have, and thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you. And once again, thank you to our guest for today, Dr. Trisha, for joining us on the show. And that's all the time that we have. Stay tuned for the next one. And that wraps up this edition of Malaysia Tonight. My name is Daryl Baptist with Otto Otman. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Thank you guys for watching. Have a grand weekend ahead. Good night.